What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to The Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what's up? It's Jay Campbell and I'm making a quick commercial here for SeerCustom.com, my revolutionary cosmeceutical peptides company, co-founded with my business partner, Nick Andrews, who happens to be one of the world's top formulators. We have the revolutionary Oxano Grow, which completely regrew my hair. If you guys saw my hair about a year ago, I was almost bald. I even had the micropigmentation program from uh, Advantis. And now I've completely regrown my hair. That's just with version one. Version two is now in the marketplace or will be very, very soon. And it is three to five times as more effective than the current version or the original beta version of Oxano. We also have Royal Blue Serum and Sky Blue Cream, which will completely upgrade your face. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I have a pretty good complexion. I use it regularly. My wife swears by it. It will reduce fine lines and wrinkles, dramatically improve elasticity, and just the overall look and feel of your face. You feel great on both of them. You can also use them with red light therapy. There's all sorts of great stuff. So go to a seercustom.com. And if you're a first time customer, use the coupon J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I appreciate all you guys and I send you tremendous love and light. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, the founder of the Jay Campbell podcast. Still not used to saying that because it used to be a different name. Uh, and I'm very excited to be joined in my Zoom virtual studio today by a very, very cool person, Josephine at Lurie. Josephine, thank you for coming on. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's amazing to have you here. So your bio is absolutely tremendous. You guys can find Josephine online at j at Lurie, A-T-L-U-R-I dot com. You can also find her on social media at Josephine at Lurie. And she has an awesome podcast, which is the Responding to Life podcast, which all those links will be, of course, in the bottom of this when this runs in a couple months, hopefully from now. We are now recording on Thursday, June 25th. So Josephine's bio is pretty amazing. She's an expert in meditation and in overcoming adversity to find joy. Who doesn't want joy and happiness today? Josephine's group and individual meditation sessions teach simple and practical coping mechanisms for stress, anxiety, and loss to help improve the balance of mind, body, and spirit through health and fertility struggles and other life challenges. That's, all, that's the whole Jay Campbell mythos now is like optimizing the mind, body, heart, and soul. Um, as creator and host of her podcast, Responding to Life, Living Reflectively Through a Journey of Health, Fertility, and Parenthood, she highlights learnings from her 13-year journey of love, loss, resilience, and hope to create her family of five children um, through IVF and adoption and surrogacy, and also shares inspirations from guests. We have also navigated life's curveballs to find joy. Josephine has a passion to help her meditation clients and, of course, her podcast listeners channel the power of perseverance, positivity, calm, courage to overcome obstacles and live joyfully and mindfully. Pretty awesome. So as I always do, Josephine, when people come on the Jay Campbell podcast, when I'm honored, humbled, privileged to have that opportunity, I have to ask, how did you get here on this podcast here today? Um, well, short answer is that I found out about you through uh, a marketing company and they were researching like-minded wellness podcasts and thought we would be a great fit. And when I started researching about you, I definitely wanted to hear more about your theories on raising your vibration. Awesome. Very, very awesome. Well, it's an honor to have you here today. Um, we have some amazing talking points. I'll start off with the first one. And, you know, this is going to be very conversational. That's kind of how I do the podcast. So it could go in any direction. So feel free to respond as uh, verbose as you'd like. So the first point that we have is how letting go is the key to raising your vibration. Now, before you answer, um, I'm a huge disciple and student of Dr. David Hawkins, and that's his bit, best book ever. Well, not best book ever, but it's the book that most people are familiar with him, which is called Letting Go. And, you know, I recommend that to people who are seeking the path, as I call it, the, the path of spirituality or 
what is as a starter book, because as you know, a lot of people are so focused on the external, they don't do internal work, they don't do any kind of self introspection or mindfulness training, as I call it. And so there's, it's kind of like a really good guideline book for people to start looking again within. But you know, talk about it, you know, from your interpretation, your perspective, how is letting go the key to elevating your vibration? Uh, well, you touched upon it. It's about doing that internal work. Right. Um, we can go from situation to situation without really addressing the roots and the causes of what happened and think that they're solved. But in essence, we're carrying around that baggage with us and it can really weigh us down and prevent us from really optimizing our lives. And so when you can let go of things such as expectations, let go of your ego, let go of the past and your ideas of what the future should be, then you're really able to live in the present and really dig deep on what's going on inside. And then from, from that openness, from that state of being, then you can really maximize your potential. But it's hard to do that when, you're, when you feel like you're being weighed down especially if you don't know what's weighing you down because you haven't looked within. So um, obviously I agree with all your points um, and there's a lot of ways I can go with that. Like let's, let's, let's relate it to now, right? Like okay. we're in this crazy world, however you want to define it, COVID shutdown, lockdown, pandemic, people wearing masks. I mean, there's so many angles, right? Like to me, now obviously I'm like you, I've been doing inner work for a long time. When I coach people or speak with people or even just like do these podcasts and talk, you know, I, I say how important that is, you know, obviously understanding that everything, all answers are found within, but you know, the average person, as you know, we were talking off air, doesn't do that work. I mean, what, how do you recommend a person starts, you know, from an easy, like do this, don't do that. Like, what would you recommend people right now who are so caught up right in the pain of this, whatever this is, it's so hard for me to characterize at this point. What would you tell people to start to remove themselves from what is going on right now to go within? I simply tell them to breathe. I just ask them to, they don't even have to sit in a full on meditation, but if they can stop and pause in the moment and practice a breathing technique, one like the ocean breath, which is just a continuous flow of breathing, then they're able to feel what it's like to be in the present moment right. and to take back control of themselves and their life through their breath. And then the more they do that, the more they can feel like they can be out of that chaos. Even if they're trapped at home, they can feel like they're in this present moment of of being within themselves. And, and all you're doing is just focusing on how that breath is moving in and out of your body. And when you're doing something like that, some sort of exercise like that, it's really hard to think about like, oh, what happens in the news this morning? And oh, I have all these things I have to get back to for work. You're just focusing on that breathing pattern. And that is a gateway into much more amazing stuff. Right. Yeah. I, I, well, well said. It's, it's interesting. Um, there's so much drama. You know, I like to tell people that you really have to create, you know, um, a, a ritual, a daily ritual. You know, people talk about morning routines and mindfulness routines, but you, you just have to do something that every single day becomes with, I like to use the term ruthless focus where it's something that you cannot put off. It doesn't be, it's not something where it's like, you know, tomorrow I'm going to get to it or maybe on Friday. It's like every single day as you go about your life, you have to de dedicate that time, whether it's 20, 30, 40 minutes, whatever you have based on your, you know, work-life balance um, of, of doing the inner work and doing this type of thing. You know, you talk about breathing, whether it's meditation. You know, I personally, I go into the forest, the na nature, my backyard sometimes, depending on my time. And I literally just completely go silent. You know, I call it the still light and mm -hmm. uh, listen to nature. 
and obviously I'm focused on my breath. I'm doing that already, but uh, it's so interesting when we go into nature, you know, or, you know, people talk about grounding, you know, put your feet in dirt, grass, mm -hmm. a stream, and just connect with that. You know what I, again, I call it this divine still light, you know, the, the, the source field, God, whatever you want to call it, however people phrase it. Um, that's truly when you're of a mind, a mind construct or a heart construct of listening to the present moment and not mm -hmm. being, you know, sucked into everything going on in the matrix, you know, which as you said, right. causes anxiety and chaos and angst and just like mm -hmm. irritability and just you know, imbalanced emotionality. And, you know, that's where we really are right now with a lot of people. And so, I mean, I really like that your advice is just, it's as simple as really just controlling your breaths, huh? Yeah. I mean, when you're sitting in, in meditation, that's one point of focus. You could do mantra, but you are sitting there and the breath is controlling that fight or flight response. So it's a great way to tell your mind, hey, I'm, I'm approaching a state of calm. I'm getting away from this stress response and I'm bringing myself into this more peaceful place. And I love how you bring up nature because that also is a great way to, to tap into presence because nature just offers you so much beauty without all of the labels, without all of the expectations. You can just appreciate it for just exactly what it is, which is why I, I love being able to just walk around in, in in the forest. I miss that. I used to live in New Hampshire, and that was that's what surrounded me. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I I truly think of nature as God. I mean, you know, there's a lot of obviously great, you know, uh, progressive teachers, ancient text writers, but they all talk about that. The, you know, the and, and and I just refer to them as ancients. There's so many people, but the ancients talked about going into nature. Mm -hmm. And literally retreating there for groups of weeks, sometimes 30 days. And, you know, you would find yourself if you were just silent around everything. Because, again, everything that's going on in nature is, again, is just essentially the divine influence of whatever the, you know, the great power, you know, the God, the source frequency that is the architect of creation. And mm -hmm. so it's like when you're there and you're experiencing that energy. And, again, you need to have no phone you know, no right. wireless frequency or EMF emitting or any of that stuff. You're just literally in the confines of nature, surrounded by that amazing, awe-inspiring natural beauty. Um, you're just going to be uplifted. You're going to find sources of inspiration. It's going to just come to you. Because again, that's really what everything is. And as human beings, we were designed to, you know, commune and to live in that energetic frequency of Mother Earth. Because Mother Earth is, you know, in my opinion, is a living, breathing organism herself. I mean, if you go into any mm -hmm. of the Mesoamerican cultures and you talk to the shamans or medicine men or medicine women, you know, they tell you Pachamama. Pachamama is living, breathing, dynamic organism. And we as human beings were designed to also live amidst her frequency and her energy. And so it's like we so, as you know, in modern day culture and modern day uh, the, ma the modern day matrix, we've disassociated that connection with the, you know, the high thick rubber shoes that never touch the ground right. or the soil, right? right? Or the, you know, of course the technology. And I, and I understand that, you know, there's a benefit. You and I are having this conversation in different various parts of the world today. And we're going to be able to share this with a lot of people. So of course there's some benefit to technology, but you can't let technology, you know, control or run your life. You, you have to moderate this and use it at specific times, obviously, but not allow yourself to be pulled so far away that you don't also connect with the energy of Mother Earth. Exactly. Yeah. You have to be able to cut the noise, right? Exactly. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about your story. Um, like you said, you have a life which has been a continuous lesson of learning to let go of control. And obviously, I've walked the same path. Um, I've been very blessed that I met my current wife who's been my greatest spiritual mentor and she's taught me so much, but something you said in, in your notes, you know, in these talking points that I really want to hit on and it's kind of off the beaten path, but I think it's perfect for both of us is that um, you have to get to a point as an adult where you realize you don't have any control. The only thing you have control over is your response 
to what happens to you, right? Your control of your state, your emotional, physiological, vibratory rate or state to all the things that happen around you. And I know as a younger, you know, very high energy guy, you know, I call, uh, people called me, they labeled me, they called me F you pay me. Right. Cause I was just like a, <laughs> like, you know, I'm serious. I was like pure ego mind, you know, just driven mm. by how much money I can make and how early I could retire, you know, all the fleshy right. earthy materialistic things of a person who had no spiritual awareness or inner awareness. And obviously, um, you know, you get to a point where, you know, for my life, I had my, my, my true dark night of the soul. Um, in my early, early forties, like right at 41, I just turned, I just turned 41 actually started happening in my 40, my 40th birthday. But, um, it was, it was, it was crazy to then start looking at things from a different perspective. And again, to go to that inner awareness state, you know, not react emotionally when stuff happens to me, not be an asshole when somebody cuts me off in a car, you know what I mean? Like all those yeah, things yeah. that we instinctively want to do living in the survival programming of earth once you start working on your inner inner game, you know, you, you, you can consciously reflect and as I always say, neutrally observe and be like, I don't have to act like that. Right. Yeah. So at what point yeah. in your journey did you really recognize that and, 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 and start to attain that type of power? Uh, probably not until meditation because I, you know, I used to refer to myself as this control freak. Um, I, I used to be an event planner and I would control people's like, celebratory moments in 15 minute increments. Like I had it in my little binder and things would go exactly like that for me was, right. that was my jam. I loved being able to make sure it all flowed the right. way I saw it. Right. And that extended into, into life. And, and then, you know, as we're starting to create our family, things were not happening the way I wanted it to. And that's when, that's when I really, I didn't see it at that point. I yeah. still tried to control it as much as possible because I didn't have meditation back then. Right. What I had back then as my source of like an outlet, my comfort, it's always been fitness. And for me, that became like my meditative state. Um, you know, it wasn't until years later that I realized I needed something more than just the physical output right. Right. that I needed to reach that mental, emotional, um, and reach those needs. And so it, I thought that once I finally had those kids, because I was trying to control that situation of fertility and having children, and it involved IVF and adoption, I finally had three kids at that point. And I thought, this is great. Like I solved my problems, it's all under control. And then lo and behold, in my early thirties, I'm preparing for my first race and I got in the best shape of my life. I did the race, it was amazing. I did a number of them. And then all of a sudden it was time to, um, like it was off training season and I couldn't, I couldn't allow myself to not control that, that I became bulimic. And I thought, how is this happening to me in my early 30s? And I'm supposed to have this happy life. I got everything I wanted. I have the kids. Right. And it was because I had all this unresolved trauma yeah. that I didn't ever tune into and deal with during that time. And so that's when I started to deal with things. And that's when I started to dabble just recreationally in meditation using just apps and here and there. And then over time, as I saw the benefits of it, that's when I really like, I just, I get, I got into it sure. because I saw that, you know, I was busy trying to control this life and that wasn't the answer. Yeah. I found the answer sitting in silence. I found myself, my real self, sitting in silence and just being me in that present moment. Right. And so that was profound. Um, That's awesome. Just that journey. You say you were just, when you said, um, you know, I was just like half ass or half in and out of meditation. I think of like, yeah, I have the app headspace on my phone. <laughs> That's how I started. <laughs> Who didn't? Who didn't? It's so funny that right. you said that because it triggered me because I was thinking like, 
I was going through my phone today when I was at my chiropractic appointment, waiting. My chiropractor's so busy. He's like the only chiropractor in where I live in Southern California, pretty much open. And so it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm like his VIP client, right? We like, we do trade for each other and stuff. And he still couldn't get to me. And I was in there and I was just going through my phone and I'm like, oh my God, I have all these apps. And you know, that came up. I was like, oh, I did. <laughs> this anymore. But I just, it triggered that, you know, thinking about when I first started doing it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, all of that is so critical. Um, it's funny because I think so many people are put off by meditation because they think they can't do it. Right. It becomes this preoccupation. Right now I tried it. It didn't work. I, I don't know how to do it. But, you know, there's the, the uh, as I call it, like the technology boom that we've had with information saturation, a lot of people are just overexposed to that idea of what it is. And so they have this like misconception or this preconceived notion that it has to be, you know, sitting in the Lotus position Right. right. And chanting, as you said, you know, um, or whatever. Right. And, and so then they lose the idea that they can actually do it. And, you know, I've found, and obviously all, as you know, every form of meditation or every individually unique person who meditates does it differently. We all have a specific mm -hmm. way. Like, you know, in my world where I was an expert, um, you know, we would always say every person is N of one. We're all biochemically unique. No one person is going to respond to any medication or intervention or form of exercise or, or anything in any specific way. Everybody is unique, you know, and created in the universe. And then people will come at me and, you know, in the consciousness space and say, that's not true, Jay. We're, we're all one collectively, you know? So it's like, it's funny because we right. do have individual uh, intervariation among our species, but at the same time, soul at a soul level, yes, we are all connected, but um, it's, it's very interesting because you don't have to meditate in any set way it really is just right. getting to a point or a place as you said already of stillness mm -hmm. of total silencing of the mind shutting off the drunk monkey whatever you want to call it that's screaming in your ego mind right. and, and and it doesn't even have to be more than five minutes it doesn't even have to be more than 10 minutes like i've gotten to the point now in this is crazy and i did this is practice it took a lot of practice but i mean i can literally meditate why I'm exercising, right? Like I can ride my exercise bike in the morning, in the dark, very early. My wife will be in the backyard. She goes to the backyard first. I go to the backyard after, but like, uh -huh. that's my, you know, you know, motion creates emotion. I, that's my uh -huh. duty time to wake up. I stretch for a little bit. I put on my um, chakra binaural beats. It's a tuning thing for nine minutes. And, mm -hmm. and then I get on my bike and, you know, I have a nice life cycle in my room and stuff like that, but I get on there. And when I'm on there, I am literally either just channeling the energy of what I want to get out of my life, just complete silence, you know, for that day, sometimes or say maybe the next week or month. And then other times I'm just reading amazing books like Walter Russell or, you know, Hawkins or things that inspire me. And I've gotten to the point where I literally can silence my mind completely and still be pedaling, you know, mm -hmm. at a steady state. And again, you know, the great teachers of silence and, and, you know, this inner stillness say that if you get to that point where you can control your body and you can control your breath, and obviously you can control everything else, your biological processes, you can do it. And it's taken me a long time, Josephine. I mean, I, it took me, I've been doing this since I was 37, religiously since I was 42 and I'm 49 now. So I just started to be able to do this like in the last six months. But, you know, as, as anything, if my daughters wake up and come in and open up the door, <laughs> dad, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I, I can pull out of that. But I mean, you know, my point is, is that anyone can learn to do this and there's, there's no rhyme or reason or specific definition of how it's done. It's just, again, getting to that place of stillness, correct? Exactly. Right. I mean, just start off slowly, but takes requires an app for you to do it to just ease into it and get used to things Do that. But having the, like you said, these preconceived notions that you have to be in this completely like empty state and you're reaching nirvana and all these things, it's so different for everyone. And it, it you know, it is, it prevents people from continuing again because like I wasn't able to shut off my mind, but really it's just a practice of right. being able to allow the thoughts to come in and then being able to just 
let them go and then returning back to the present moment. It's this constant ebb and flow, constant practice, which is really just what life is. Yeah. So that when you're in a life situation, you're able to just be focused on what it is that you're doing, whether that's work, whether it's speaking to your spouse or your child, you're there and you get that practice for meditation because you're able to just be in that, in that moment, in that connection. I, I love one of your points. You say you strive to let go of three main things during your meditation. And that is your mm -hmm. expectation of yourself and others, huge, your ego, and then um, your past and future. So to appreciate the now. And before you answer on that, um, my biggest issue is judgment. Right. Okay. You get to be very spiritually aware and advanced and you start seeing people that, you know, are not instead of like, you know, because like I, I can appreciate people for their message and for ever, anything. And, but then I could still like, you know, it's that, that spiritual attuning of like, okay, I'm looking at this person and I'm instantly labeling or categorizing or classifying mm -hmm. her or him. You know, I, mm -hmm. I say her cause I'm thinking of this person I watched on a podcast yesterday morning and you know, I was like instantly tuned off. But it's like I started listening and the message was really resonant. And it's getting to the point where you can appreciate everyone and everything, which is what you're really saying and what you're saying there, without attachment mm -hmm. to a label or to your ego, you know, or like you said, having expectations. Talk about that. Right. So I'll bring it back to that point of nature. And um, I had said that it's the easiest way to, to practice this letting go of labels and expectations. Because when you're looking, say, at a tree, it's just a tree. Right. You don't have all this baggage from like, oh, this tree did this to me. And, oh, it should be responding to me in this way. And it should be this and that. It's just, you're looking at it and it's beautiful. Right. And that's, that is an example of practicing, like witnessing that present moment. Right. And so when you let go of expectations, like this was a big thing for me because... I, first of all, just expectations of myself, like what I should be during that. I saw that in my journey of fertility, like I should be a mother. I'm a woman. I should be producing children. And, and then with others, like my mother should be this type of person. My father should be this type of person and they're who they are. Right. So if you can just ex learn to, let go of your own labels yep. and allow yourself to just be and see where that leads you. That's really freeing. Yeah. And then you're able to really just maximize what you can do in life. And then in terms of others, if you just let go of the idea of what they should be to you right. and just really see who they are as a person, right. then, then you can let that love flow then there's that blockage is gone. And that, that was super hard for me, especially as, you know, as like a sister or a daughter or, you know, a loved one of someone. You have all these feelings of how life should have been, how you should be treated, all these things. But, you know, in sitting in meditation and doing all this inner work, that's when you start to realize that you can control who they are and who they are to you. You can just learn to accept yeah. who they are in that moment. And again, it's another like freeing moment. And so a great way to start practicing it is to do what you mentioned, which is go into nature because it's so easy there. Right. You can learn to appreciate things. It's so much harder when you're trying to dig into yourself and into your relationships. It takes time. You have to be super patient. Yeah, I totally. And, and just to your point, like, that's why I do the nature after I do my cardio because I just slept the whole night and now I've just done the cardio. I've increased the blood flow, right? I've got the endorphins, the encalphins, all that stuff going. But now I'm going to go out into nature and I'm going to literally just, I lay back. Usually it's just in my backyard, depending on how much time I have with my dogs. And I just lay back on like a lounge chair, not a full lounge chair, like layout chair, but just like one of those beach chairs, you know, that lays back. Uh -huh. And I put my feet in the grass and, you know, my head is balanced on kind of like a little resting push cushion. And I literally just listen to the sounds yeah. of nature. And honestly, again, so much of doing it, you know, thousands of times now, 
I can truly almost leave my body. Now, not astral projection type stuff, but like I feel yes. like I am observing completely neutral from outside my physical being and just listening to the birds and the bees and the wind and all that stuff. And of course the dogs will bark every now and then, but like, it's just, you're in that field. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and I can talk about that field because I've done plant medicine a number of times and I, I really understand being in the field of what it feels like because it's just purely um, harmonics. It's like a vibrational resonance that you feel you know, outside of your body, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. what you, have you done plant medicine before? No, I haven't, but I've had that feeling. Yeah, that you have. You that. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you'll get it either way. You can do it in both, but like, you really do feel when you leave your body on, on a form of plant medicine, um, for some people who's experienced that you do feel your energy. Like you mm -hmm. actually feel the base essence of who we are as beings, right? Like we're not these bodies, you know that we're just energy. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I feel like I'm a slinky. I feel like I'm outside my body, but I can just touch my body with my energy. It's pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's so critical to get into nature and to allow the power of the you know, divine creative flow or energy of nature to just influence you to silence your mind. Another thing you said that I really like, um, I allow love to flow into my love. I love that. My wife has been saying to me, since we met eight years ago, there's only two purposes why we're here as beings, as human beings, and that is to give and to receive mm -hmm. love, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, if you really break it down, sure, there's other reasons why we're here, we're creating and stuff like that. But if you really break it down, what are you going to take with you beyond the physical body expiration? You're not taking anything other than your experiences, right? So if you've been right. giving love and receiving love, then that's part of your soul, and your spirit yes. has that, you know, indelible mark now on it. So, you know, if you go, depending on your beliefs after, you know, for after uh, death or physical body expiration, you know, that energy that you've, you know, experienced in that lifetime or many lifetimes or whatever, you know, of loving and g giving love and receiving love is like really a mark. You know, people talk about you're not going to take your material things or you're not going to take your money or anything, any, anything of matter or material possession with you. You are going to take your love that you've get that you've given and received, right? Right. Yes. So that was one of the other points of of letting go was that ego, because when you let go of that ego of yours, you're able to be of service to others. Exactly. When you're being of service, really, what you're doing is you're giving love, right? You're giving of yourself so very passionately, and you're doing that exchange exactly of what that is. Yeah, yeah. I love that. It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been rough for a lot of people, probably both of us, even people of a very advanced spiritual nature in this last three months, right? Because we've seen so much breakdown. We've seen so much collective trauma, you know, in the right. universe. And, and I think, you know, this, and this is always the last thing to learn, I think, as an advanced spiritual disciple or initiate or whatever, but as much as you might want to help others, you know, through your guidance, wisdom, advice, you can't do it until they seek it out, right? Like there's just yeah. no way. Right. You never sit down with your brothers or sisters or your friends or family and like tell them about right. what I experienced because you're asking for trouble because, you know, I have a really good spiritual mentor who made this comment to me and I always remember, I, I mean, when I'm talking to people like you, I bring it up, but he's like, this is his comment. He says, people have the right to be entertained. I'm sorry, the, the right, oh, I just lost it. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The, the, uh, the right to remain asleep for as long as it entertains them, right? That's a profound oh, statement. yeah. Think about that. So, you know, because, you know, you hear right. this, the old school statement of like ignorance is bliss, but people, people are sovereign and empowered, right? And they have a choice to right. believe or to think or to feel you know, any way they want. And you and me have no right to say, well, look, dude, you know, that yes. may be cool, but you know, there's a higher form of consciousness or a higher state of awareness, right. Then, then where you're at right now. But again, that's their choice. If they want to remain at that level. And again, so many people, as you know, Josephine right now are down here, right. Vibrating mm -hmm. in victimhood and shame and anger. Mm -hmm. and apathy. That's their choice. They're allowed to do right. that. And so you and me and people like us have to accept them and allow them. But obviously, 
my recommendation is don't, you know, don't be having a lot of personal conversations with them at that level because you're just going to be drawn into something you don't want to have. You know what I mean? Yes. Experience. Right. Yeah. And that's when I'm letting go of my expectations of exactly. them or my hopes right. of what they can be. That is the hardest part. I think once, as you continue on with your own spiritual journey and your yeah. inner work, it becomes really hard, especially with your really close loved ones to, to see them not make that journey with you. It is, man. Especially like with my family. It's funny, you know, I'm from a very large Irish Catholic family. I'm the oldest of nine. My mom actually gave birth to ten, but that that one died of SIDS before me. And they wow. named he his name was Christopher J and they named me J Christopher after him. But uh oh. not a lot of people in my family have advanced consciously. They're all very successful in the material, you know, realm or the matrix, you know, from a label standpoint, but um they're just not doing the inner work and they won't embrace it. But you know, I have to it's a choice for me to love them or to push them away. And I obviously I still choose yes. to love them. But as you just said, it's not an easy thing to do when right. you see them, you know, reacting viscerally and emotionally without kind of like a neutral observer, you know, inner, an inner, an inner work experienced mindful person isn't going to act right. that way. And so it's difficult sometimes for me where I'm at, what I'm doing, where how, the path that I'm walking to like interrelate, with them it's as you said the only thing you can do and my wife always says this is just send them love yes. right because you can't right. get into that conversation because you're only going to get dragged into something that a they don't understand and b they're not ready for at their current right. state right. to even talk to you about yeah exactly it, it is it is tough and do you accept them for for who they are and just be ready if that ever happens, right. they're ready to do the work and let love in. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. That's what you have to do yeah. though. You're, you're right. Like you, you, you just have to just like, when they're ready, they'll come to you. And then that's when you have to shower them with, you know, your awareness and your love and just yeah. you know, experience, show them a different way, you know, or, or, or talk to them about the things that you've learned and doing it in a very non-confrontational, you know, non-pushy, you know, you're just basically saying, hey, look, this is what I've learned. Maybe this can help you. But as you know, there's a lot of people today, in the, especially in the new age or the consciousness movement, that are really trying to proselytize mm -hmm. and push, you know, this kind of stuff on, the, on you know, people in their family or stuff. You know, and I have that a lot. I have a lot of friends and stuff come to me like, well, how do you talk to them about the things that you know? And I say, I don't. Like, yeah. unless they want it and they come to me seeking it out, I'm not going to waste yeah. my time you know, right. blabbering or like I said, proselytizing or preaching to people who don't necessarily want it. It's the dumbest thing. But again, it's, it's, it's hard because again, the media, you know, in the mainstream, in the matrix is constantly promoting this victimhood consciousness, you know, that is now so commonplace. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of hard because like you really do, you know, as a good person who gives love and receives love, you want to help people, but you just have to learn that, that inner awareness of like when to help out and when not to. Right. I get a lot of practice with the kiddos <laughs> and right. seeing them go through life and not taking my advice. <laughs> it's true. My, so my 10 year old daughter is so different than my 12 year old daughter. My 12 year old daughter is totally sovereign, empowered and free. She does her thing. She doesn't blame anybody else. She works hard. She's in gymnastics or awesome. cheerleading. Yeah. But my 10 year old is total victimhood vibrations. Her name is Gabriella. And she's always telling me it's someone else's fault. Mm, I hear that one. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm like, I'm like, Gabby, it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not anyone else's fault. You're choosing everything, everything that you do, everything that you get, everything that happens to you is a product of the decisions that you are making. So it's right. harder for her to understand that. And I think, and you probably know this, Josephine, but like the kids of today are so bombarded by digital imagery and YouTube, oh, yeah. TikTok, and all of this all nonsense. Of yes. And all of that is teaching them that it's not, that, you know, that they basically are learning that they're not to be a personal, personally accountable, that mm. it's, mm -hmm. it's society or it's this or it's that or it's that. And that's where my daughter is. And it's just... It's so crazy that my 12 year old is not like that, but my 10 year old is. And again, as you know, they're all different. You have five too. So, I mean, it's like, you just have to accept them and allow them and hopefully 
again, my opinion, to coach them right. where you yes. see that breakdown is. I mean, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I heard all those same things. That's why I was laughing because it's the same things you were saying, I say, yeah. and definitely different personalities, different kids approach life differently, which makes it hard yeah. um, that one can see the right way to approach life, the right responses to life. The other one is acting, you know, just um, not taking their actions into account and blaming other people. So, you know, that's tough, but all, you're right. All you can do is really coach them and just create positive mindsets, which is what I try to always do with them at the end of the day is just to ingrain that in them with gratitude and showing love for themselves through affirmations right. and just trying to instill a base framework for them. Yeah. But giving and receiving love. That's what right. we're doing. That's yeah. it. That's it. Your last point, you know, which we kind of really cover, but I'll just briefly, you know, address it and you can talk about it is just controlling your responses to life as it happens. And then of course your mindset and that's everything, you know, we could go into the whole realm of quantum physics and say that when you understand quantum physics, even if you don't have any understanding of it, it's just basically the, the world is a mirror, right? Like how you feel internally is what you project outwardly or externally and so it's like when you start understanding that stuff, um, you realize that when people say mean things to you or negative things or antagonistic things, that's how they actually feel internally and they're right. projecting it outward at you. So once you start understanding that kind of stuff, you do realize that you are never more than, but a, than anything but a projection of how you feel inside. So when you feel positive and you feel in control of your state of being and you love and trust yourself there's no way that you're going to deal you're, you're going to create that you know that you won't do anything but create that same feeling externally in your communication and your interaction with others and so it's mm -hmm. like you know you say it beautifully it's a, really truly about controlling your responses yes it is i mean and that's that is like we're all trying to control every aspect of life um, and once we realize that we can't control all those other things that we have just control of how we respond to others and how we respond to life situations, we can choose to do it mindfully and positively and with love, then that is what you'll notice when you're interacting with someone. I see it all the time with, you know, I'll bring it back to my kids because it's so simple that way. When I am approaching them, in just that manner, in that mindful and positive manner, that is how they respond back to me. But if I come to them with this negative energy and energy that is really about me and what's happening to me in my life, I'll, I'll receive that same negative energy back just right. instantly because that's what they're feeding off of. And so if you can just, you know, try every day to respond to life just, you know, in one instance, you'll start to see that feedback and that feedback is fantastic because it's positive stuff that's coming right. back to you. And then you'll start to, to ingrain that in your mind and start to choose that path versus that other negative and heavy and um, dark path versus this light and versus the light and the love that you can get if you're choosing to be mindful and positive. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is true. So many people, when you really start understanding the laws of quantum physics that you get what you focus on, you stop focusing on what you don't have. And so mm -hmm. many people are fixated oh, yeah. on what they don't have instead of what they want. Right. And that's, right. that's the beauty of the world. You know, and again, you know, the whole law of, of resonance, which is really the law of attraction is you only are going to get what you're focused upon. So all these people that want a better life, they want, you know, more money, they want a better job, they want a better spouse, they want a better everything. They're fixated on what they don't have, instead right. of on the path or the, you know, the process of getting what they want. And it's just exactly. so crazy how simple that is. And you know, when people say to me, 
uh, and I'm a, I'm a big student of hermetics and that, but it's like when people say to me, the law of attraction is all made up. It's like, well, yeah, to you it is because you're still focusing, focusing on lack mm. and what you don't have. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Once you set your mind onto that positive path, the world just opens up to you because there's nothing that isn't possible. Yeah, and no, you just and then you just start to see all the amazing things that that are there for you. It's why it's 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 why having a glass half full mindset is always the best way. And honestly, I I had to overcome that because my dad taught me that a glass half empty is the best way to go through life because you're prepared for the worst. I mean, mm-hmm. seriously, like yeah, he that as a kid. So I was dealing with that my whole life, you know, thinking like, yeah. you know, I'll just, pre- I'll prepare for the worst. And if right. the opposite happens then the, you know, then uh, you know what, I'll be insulated. I mean, it's crazy yeah. how we learn from our parents or from our mentors right. or for anybody, but like, I really had to overcome that, you know, and I, yeah. so I always had kind of like a glass half full or glass half empty perspective of life, you know, and, and right. then, that also kept me from like really realizing that I was enough and that I was loved oh, yeah. and trusted myself. Cause I was, well, you're not able to work. live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're not able to live. You're always hunkering down and trying to prepare for what ifs. Exactly. When you're preparing for the what ifs and the future and thinking all about that kind of stuff. You're not able to be tuned in into what life is and how amazing it is. Exactly. It oh, took me 30, that's tough, 38 man. years to overcome I that. As you know, no matter what trauma has happened to you, no matter what happened to you as a child, coming through the birth canal, mommy and daddy didn't love you enough, whatever, you can overcome anything with will and intention. And Absolutely. You know, going internally and learning to you know, self-analyze and become self-aware, as you said, um, that's the key to everything. And once you become self-aware, you know, you had bulimia. I'm sure you've had other traumas that have happened to you in your life. It's like, it's, 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 it's recognition of the problem first before you can actually take towards steps towards the solution. Because as you know, so many people refuse to do a deep dive analysis of who they really are. Oh, right. Yeah. It's too scary. I don't want to do the work. Yeah. Too scary. Especially right now. There's so much trauma that's like you know bubbling to the surface right now of people and most people that are you know i don't know how to observe it you know to to label it you know cancel culture i think is the best thing right now like all those people absorbing that and saying that's okay that's them not embracing their trauma and not Mm -hmm. like resisting the reality of you know this is like that statement of like hey man you know it's okay you had a trauma. We all had this trauma. We've, we're all experiencing this dark night, collective dark night of the soul. Now it's okay. Right. You're okay. You're, you're, you're okay to acknowledge it, not to bury it and, and suppress it and, you know, let it sit there, you know, not, not integrated, but um, yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of where we are right now. I mean, everything we just talked about is what the collective vibration or the collective uh, consciousness right now of humanity really needs to accept that like, Hey man, acceptance, Mm -hmm. start going within, you know, doing the meditation, doing the contemplation, the mindfulness stuff. And then all your answers are going to be revealed to you because you're brave enough to actually walk that path. Right. Yeah. That's that, that is how you get into it. That's that brave step of just, confronting who you are right and you know one of my favorite quotes is when i let go of who i am i become what i might be and in order to let go though you have to do that inner work and face all of the things that you've been you've been burying deep within that you just didn't have the courage to face but when you when you are able to do that then you can finally free yourself and then you can really be who you potentially could be beautiful beautiful yep. josephine at Lurie, this has been a phenomenal podcast right it's been at, so great speaking to you right at 38 minutes if someone wants to work with you get a copy of your book watch your podcast what is the best way where, where would we send them uh send them to my website j at Lurie.com. there you'll get a link to sign up for my monthly newsletter i do a free meditation 
every Wednesday for 15 minutes on Zoom. You'll get that link if you sign up. And I'm doing a special fertility workshop August 1st. So you can empower your fertility journey using mindfulness and meditation. Beautiful. Is that for uh, women and men or just women? Women and men. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, they Very all go through it. Yeah. So. No, believe me, I have tons of friends right now that can't get pregnant. They, you know, the, the environment, I mean, I talk a lot about that in my books. The environment is so contaminated right now. It's just so mm -hmm. difficult to, yeah. uh, for men and women to be fertile. It used to be like right. that was not an issue. No, 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 it's a major issue. So you're tackling a very, very big issue. So that's awesome. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Um, it's been epic. So everybody, of course, please support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Please visit Josephine at her website. It's Jay at Lurie.com or follow her on social media at Josephine at Lurie. And of course, please seek out her Responding to Life podcast. Josephine, I really appreciate you. This podcast will probably run sometime, mm, I want to say September, even possibly October, because my funnel is pretty high, but you'll get a whole week um, of it being publicized across YouTube, uh, across all social media, of course, and then also on my blog at jccampbell.com. So I truly appreciate awesome. you. Remember, everybody, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys soon.